In the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark, in the third chapter, listen now for God's word to you. Again, Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. And the Pharisees watched Jesus to see whether Jesus would cure the man on the Sabbath so that they might accuse Jesus. And Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. And then Jesus said to the Pharisees, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or kill? But they were silent. And Jesus looked around at them with anger, and he was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And then the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against Jesus how to destroy him. Now the grass withers and flowers fade, but the living word of God will stand forever. Amen. Will you please be seated? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I have some sound advice for you today. Whatever you do, never read a book about diseases and their symptoms. I know this from experience. It was the summer of 1964. I was 12 years old and uh, my family and I went on vacation and I brought this book about diseases and their symptoms. And after reading it, every little pain, every little gastric bubble, every little twitch of muscle. I knew, I knew I was dying from either bubonic plague, malaria, or some other horrible disease. We were vacationing in Montreat, North Carolina, and we had rented a cabin, my family had, just down the road from Billy Graham, summer retreat just up the road gated as it was and in the morning i i would wake up and was waiting waiting for the onset of yellow fever and i figured i could run up the road and ask billy to cure me A few years later, I read a book called None of These Diseases. And the author, using Levitical laws, laws of cleanliness and laws concerning diet, said that so many of our diseases would not exist if we would just follow those laws. The conclusion I reached was that diseases were brought on by breaking the laws of Moses. But since I was older, when I read this particular book, I figured while I might avoid the diseases in the book, I would most certainly get other diseases not included in the book. To understand this text, think of a time... Think think of a time before the advancements of medical science, the advancement of genetics. A time before people knew and could see bacteria. 
a time before they knew about viruses, a time with their primitive understanding of cause and effect, and a time where genetic anomalies were considered a curse by God upon that person, and mental illness was caused by demonic possession. To these people, in the days of Jesus, it was quite evident that this man outside of the synagogue, Jesus is just about to enter, and there he stands, the one with the withered hand. It was evident that he was a sinner. It was a simplistic logic based upon what we would call a faulty premise. Since God wanted us to be healthy, and since the man was not, this must be a punishment by God. And since he had not been healed of the withered hand, he must not, in fact, be repentant. He stands outside the law of God, outside the love of God. And there he is, outside of the synagogue, not allowed to go in and worship with the people because that was only for righteous people. He would defame their acceptable worship to God. A group of Pharisees had been following Jesus and his disciples. And they, I guess, carried their little black book with them, marking down every infraction of the law they could find this band of brothers making. They walked through a field of wheat, and some of them reached up and tore off some of the grains of the wheat and popped the wheat grains in their mouth and there they're working on the Sabbath day write that down and perhaps they even walked too far to get to the synagogue on the Sabbath day ah write that down that's verboten forbidden and now they arrive at the synagogue Oh, Jesus is playing into their hands now. There's a man with a, a crippled hand, a withered hand there. Let's see what he will do. If he heals them, we've got him in a trap. And Jesus heals it. Underscore. Underscore that. You know, to understand really what's going on, the Pharisees were like the religious police in present-day Saudi Arabia. On a certain day of the week in certain parts of Saudi Arabia in public, those who had been caught by the religious priests the religious police, considering, uh, depending on what their infraction was, they will be caned in public. Anywhere from ten times to up to over a hundred. Then they might be taken off to be put in prison for things that we can't even imagine. Or if it's something like theft, right there in public, the hands are cut off. If it's robbery, not only the hands, but the feet are cut off. If it's adultery, they are stoned. And if it's blasphemy against God, then their heads are cut off. This is the context in which Jesus lived. 
Don't you remember? They were going to stone that woman taken in adultery. Didn't have to go to a court. And Jesus is accumulating infraction upon infraction. And when you think about his crucifixion, in Sharia law, crucifixion is allowed. He received the beating of rods, the tearing of his flesh, being impaled upon a cross and death. But the man with the withered hand, we don't even know his name. He was a sinner. He was one not loved by God. Who of us can ever forget as we went through American literature, Nathaniel Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter and the memorable Hester Prynne. Hester Prynne becomes pregnant and has a small child by someone who is unknown and she in all her honor will not tell. Little child's name is Pearl. And she wants to keep that child. But she is made to wear a scarlet letter A standing for adulteress for the rest of her life. See, see the sinner. And all the while, lurking in the background, the religious leader, Reverend Dimsdale, is the father of that child and says nothing. And Hester Prynne outshines all in that book with her love. His hand was a scarlet letter. Do you see now the threat posed by Jesus on this religious system? It was a wholesale destruction of their method of being able to separate the sheep from the goats, the good from the bad. Now you might be asking, why did they have such a cruel system? Was it just simply ignorance masquerading as a kind of faith? Well, I suspect that's a part of it. But there's something greater that drives this perspective, this theological bent. And psychologically speaking, it is fear. Fear. Fear of disease. Fear of disability. And our old friend, the fear of death. And to maintain the principle that sinners are the ones on whom God puts disabilities and disease. The one that God makes suffer. They had to abate the tendrils of that fear by pretending to be righteous or believing themselves to be righteous in the eyes of God. When we see these things, what do we think? What if it happens to me? Do we not fear that? Is our attitude about illness and death all that different in this day and time? Are we really free of fear of becoming helplessly ill? Are we really above assigning blame 
to those who are ill and dying in an all too human attempt to distance ourselves from the same thing happening to us. Do we not play the blame game? At least way back there in our subconscious mind. And it erupts to our conscious mind when we see it. Well, if they had not smoked, they would not have cancer. If they had never taken a drink, they would not have liver disease. If they had eaten healthily, if they had exercised regularly, they would not be ill. And all this may be true. I, but by the same token, I can tell you, people get seriously ill who have not smoked, who have not had anything to drink, who have always watched their diet and regularly exercised. And to blame those actions is simply establishing a buffer between us and them and the cause of our deep-seated fears. I've seen it. I go to the hospital and the father or the mother is dying one of the children says, I just can't go in there. I want to remember them like they were. And I have come this close, this close to saying, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me that you will not go in in this time of great isolation when they are alone and give your love and express it as they are leaving this world? But I did not. Because hospital rooms are not a good place for fistfights. But I've also seen other things. I remember a woman, she's gone now, and this woman had five boys. Five. Can you imagine that? I mean, when they got in a fight, all of them got in a fight. You'd have to have a Texas Ranger to break it up. And these were tough guys. Some of them rode bulls in rodeos. I remember uh, shaking hands. Don't shake too hard. I got gored by a bull the other night, right in the rib cage. One of them passed away before the mother, but on the woman's deathbed, you got to see this in your mind. These four guys, men's men, crawled up in the bed with their mother. To her last breath, they were there. In the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, a hundred million people in the world died. Five percent of the world died in that. As a matter of fact, the life expectancy in the United States for the year 1918 went down 12 years. It was a fascinating disease from, I guess, from a medical point of view, most 
uh, flus attack primarily the very young and the very old. This one, for those in their prime of health, it was most virulent. And yet, the nurses and the doctors went, left their homes, and went and ministered to those with Spanish flu. Some of them never left the shift, for they died on shift. You talk about saints whose names are unknown. Jesus heals this man with the withered hand. And yes, it was a miracle in that man's life. But it's also another miracle. It was the beginning of the death of a cruel system of placing blame on those who are sick or disabled or dying. It was also a miracle of revelation of the relationship that God has with us even though we are ill. It is not because God has forsaken. God never forsakes. And finally, yeah, it was a miracle because those who follow in the footsteps of Christ, those who are willing are free from that fear. That we can go and minister to those who suffer. Jesus spoke, touched, loved, and wept with those he healed. Not just those who were sick of disease, but also those who were in isolation and shame. Those who had had inflicted on them rules that were not true. Because the author of those rules cared more about being theologically correct. It was more important for them to be right than to care about people. May God's Spirit move within us. That fear be taken away so that we are free to love Love without judgment and love without fear. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.